Hey, it's so good to be here with everyone. I'm, I'm an unemployed restaurant worker, and these are discussions we're having in the United States. So to be part of an international discussion on this is really important. Um, the whole the whole neoliberal period of um, precarization of the workplace, dismantling of social services, has created everywhere and in the United States as well a precarious generation. And currently what we're seeing is a moment where that generational precarity is interacting with the COVID crisis, with the particularities of US racism, the particularities of the period, and producing new struggles. Um, since the COVID crisis hit with the lockdown and quarantine, 36 million people have filed for unemployment benefits. So that's 36 million people who are officially unemployed, but that doesn't count undocumented immigrants who aren't eligible for any social services. And it doesn't count a lot of precarious workers who either do gig work or work under the table where their pay isn't official. 148,000 people have died from COVID in the United States. Black people in the United States are three times as likely to die of COVID or have died at three times the rate as white people. 26 million people have attended a Black Lives Matter demonstration. So these are some of the dynamics that exist um, in the United States right now. And I think that the anti-racist rebellion, um, which is multiracial and explosive, has been multiracial and explosive and touched a nerve because of the confluence of all these issues. The connections between these things, the disgust with the Trump regime, everything Trump tried to do to quell the protests, to quell the anger, um, backfired on him and um, continued to foster um, a generational disgust against racism um, and against um, the, the dynamics of, of what racism looks like when connected with unemployment and, and a COVID crisis that disproportionately affects black workers. Um, essential workers, meaning the people who run the hospitals, the people who run um, the essential services like sanitation um, are disproportionately black and brown in the United States, disproportionately put at risk, disproportionately low paid work. Um, unemployed workers um, are overrepresented in the unemployment in the unemployed numbers. Um, there's because of this, there's been a rise in precarious sectors of organizing both around the job where you get paid such little money, but you're asked to rich, risk your life at work. So there's been actions to demand that um, restaurants and um, all kinds of places close be, in, in order not to risk COVID, but also the fact that wages have been so low. There's been demands around hazard pay where people should be guaranteed um, time and a half if they're being forced to work in these conditions. Um, and also the Black Lives Matter demands have also um, been brought to some of the essential workplaces where demands around racism at the job um, have, have um, continued to, to pick up steam. Um, the reason why precarious workers are overrepresented in the unemployed has everything to do with the way that the quote unquote recovery of the economy happened after the crisis of 2007, 2008. And we saw this very acutely with the Occupy Wall Street movement where um, there, there was a, a very clear moment where the, the issues of youth unemployment, student debt, all these things mounting were very much at the forefront of national discussion. And after that time, there was an increase in the number of jobs that existed, but this job growth was all in precarious sectors. The lowest paid, least stable jobs where you don't get access to any type of benefits, you don't have health insurance, you barely make enough to pay your bills. Um, the, this service jobs in restaurants and in other, other service sectors was 84% of new job growth between 2010 and 2018. So we had the number of people unemployed went down, but it was in jobs that were incredibly precarious and that leave people, even while working, just one small <laughs> crisis away from losing everything and not knowing what the future holds. In the United States, when you're a precarious worker, you have no access to health care. You have no savings. You have um, ha a situation where housing is incredibly expensive. And on top of that, you're also likely to have student debt because there's no um, national education system. 
and you're likely to have credit card debt to make up for those shortcomings. Um, this, this economic crisis that has, um, it, it wasn't caused by COVID, but it certainly was exacerbated by it, is putting millions and millions of people, overwhelmingly young, overwhelmingly precarious, disproportionately immigrants, in an incredibly impossible situation where people are faced with whether or not they're gonna be able to have enough to survive. Um, in this context, in the United States, we need to develop new forms of organization. We are uh, in, in the restaurant industry, which I'm a part of, it, the unionization rates are 1.2%. So this is part of the reason why these jobs are so precarious is put, because they're so unorganized, because they're so um, overrepresented of immigrant workers, of workers who work under the table, workers who work for tips, there, it has been very difficult to figure out the leverage point where we could organize and establish enduring um, workers' power in the industry. Um, I'm part of a new project that's trying to figure out how to do this in the restaurant industry. And I think that in other sectors, there's also attempts at trying to have some of these discussions in this context. Um, the unemployment benefits that were extended by the federal government are about to run out. So any income that people who are unemployed have had during this COVID time is about to expire. And there's not enough jobs. Um, so in the, the restaurant, I'll just give a little report about the restaurant work. All of a sudden you have this, this industry, which is all very small little workplaces, like nine in 10 restaurants have less than 50 workers. It's dispersed across all kinds of different shops, all small little bosses. And all of a sudden, every single restaurant worker is in the exact same position all at once, facing the same crisis all at once. And this provides important opportunities for us to actually build networks and build a strategy to develop organization in the face of what is going to be a protracted long-term crisis. Um, so I started an organization called the Restaurant Organizing Project through my socialist organization, the Democratic Socialists of America. And we've been building around workplace demands, but also around unemployment demands. And our vision is that we want to build an industry-wide force of people that could actually impact what the restructuring of the industry is going to look like in the face of this economic crisis. And I am, I, it's an uphill battle because it's an incredibly difficult situation. As unemployment goes up, it also puts new pressures on workers not to organize. But the crisis is so deep that there will continue to be struggles and it's interacting with the black struggle in a way that is, is not just gonna go away, it has to continue and people are gonna continue to fight because their lives depend on it. Um, it was been, it's been so great to be here with you all and I look forward to future discussions, solidarity. Gracias Natalia, ahora continúa el compañero Nick Reich de Australia, de Alternativa Socialista. Oh, um, thanks for everyone for having me. Thank you, G'day, comrades. Um, so yeah, I'll just say like, much like what the rest of the speakers have said, the recent history of class war in Australia and around the world, it's the story of long, a long boss's offensive, um, a one-sided class war where the bosses are winning. Neoliberal austerity is the norm. Both in Australia, our Tory and Labor Party have vied to be the best economic managers. Um, they've been cutting public services and slashing budgets to prove that to the capitalist class that they're the best at managing the budgets. Productivity and corporate profit rates have massively outpaced wage growth. In fact, real wages have all but stagnated for decades and insecure work has become increasingly prevalent especially amongst young workers, women and migrants. Union membership is somewhere around 15% of the whole workforce and the strike rate is utterly, utterly abysmal. And so as the COVID pandemic spread to Australia, all the existing fault lines of struggle were further stressed and more fault lines have opened up. This is the landscape upon which this has played out and interacted with all of the existing bosses offensives and so two key battlegrounds of the COVID class war have played out, I think. Firstly, the fight for our lives, and secondly, the fight for our livelihoods. 
In Victoria, the state where I live in Australia, we're currently in the midst of a second wave of the virus. And our state premier has highlighted that 80% of all active cases right now have been linked to workplace transmissions. He admitted that it's precisely because insecure work, mostly young, low-paid workers with no access to sick leave or anything like that, they don't want to take time off work to get tested and, God forbid, have to then self-isolate for weeks without pay. Not only would this mean financial hardship for them, but it would, mean, it would probably mean that they would be frowned upon by their boss and probably wouldn't keep getting shifts after that. Workplaces are the transmission belts via which the virus is travelling and ravaging the already exploited young working class. Not only are the workers here clearly the sacrificial lambs killed by the virus in underfunded hospitals, all at the altar of profit, but the face of economic coercion is made bare when going to work is at the risk of our lives. Like, why would we otherwise risk our lives um, if we weren't casual and couldn't otherwise pay the bills? All of the existing kind of precarity that young workers have been pushed into, having to live paycheck to paycheck, not knowing if they're going to get a shift week to week, is now laid bare because they're risking their lives in order to keep coming into work and spreading the virus. That's basically the dynamic to which this second wave has been put down to. We could have got rid of it after the first wave. Um, transmissions and active cases were down so low. We're in a particular situation in Australia where because we're an island nation closed off from the rest of the world, um, we can close our borders and potentially we could have gotten rid of um, the virus if the economy didn't come before all else and workers weren't put out to slaughter. Um, and consistently act as the transmission belt for the virus, now ravaging young workers again. But beyond that, also entire industries were decimated in the economic crisis um, at the advent of this health crisis, particularly the hospitality industry, where a lot of young people and students work. Um, that industry has massively contracted and thrown hundreds of thousands of young people into unemployment. The unemployment rate is expected to peak above 9% soon. And whilst that unemployment rate is still on the rise, the government has just announced that in September they'll reverse the modest increase that they gave to welfare and sink it back well below the poverty line again. And so the indignity of poverty in a world of plenty will be directly felt by far wider layers of people. And those people will put downward, will be used by the capitalist class to put downward pressure on the wages and conditions of every other worker, which they're desperate to do now in the context of an economic crisis. They want to push up profit rates as the GDP slumps. And in order to do that, they can use this massive unemployed workers um, to push down our wages and our conditions for those of us still in work. And so we are still fighting for our livelihoods as well as fighting for our lives, those of us who are employed and those of us who are unemployed as well. Because unemployment is a fact. But given now the government has an enormous debt and is still committed to neoliberal policies of cutting and being good economic managers, in the near future, it's likely that they're going to move to massively cut um, even beyond the cuts that they've already announced. And so in this context where all of these fault lines of struggle have been opening up and potentialities basically laying bare all of the existing inequities of capitalism, the fact that we're coerced, economically coerced via insecure and casual work to horrible conditions um, in the gig economy and in casual work um, in the hospitality industry or, or various other um, industries that the neoliberal bosses offensive have decimated. Now all of those sorts of horrible things are, have been laid bare before people's eyes and there's a real potential, there's a real pressure cooker, as, as was said before, um, for struggle to break out. But one of the dynamics that plagues us at the moment as well is the fact that union bureaucrats and the Labor Party have not been organising struggle in this context at all. Unions, particularly in Australia, are bloated multi-million dollar bureaucracies deeply inculcated into the state. And the Labor Party is a deeply neoliberal, moribund capitalist party. Both of them are by and large a ballast against the aspirations of rank and file workers, 
a conservative social layer arguing for the status quo, especially in the context of a crisis. The Labor Party, which is the semi-autonomous political wing of the trade union bureaucracy, they joined a war cabinet with the capitalist Liberal Party to help them govern. Um, and often in that position, argue for them to govern more harshly. For example, they said that the recent raises to welfare um, to about $1,500 a fortnight was too high. Um, and people, they, that's going to rack up the debt too much and the Liberals should be cutting it much sooner than they already have, um, which is appalling coming from a party that is, is supposed to stand for the working class. Um, and also, to boot, the leader of the peak trade union body is in weekly Cushing meetings with the Liberal Industrial Relations Minister. They're closing ranks um, and a bunch of unions have negotiated with bosses' organisations to lower workers' wages um, in order to see through the crisis and protect the economy and in, in order to save jobs is one of the key arguments. And so all of these bureaucracies are closing ranks to defend the system in the context of a crisis. And there's no real pressure being put on them from below by struggle. Um, and so I think that's going to be one thing that we're going to have to face in the near future if struggle does break out in the context of mass unemployment, unsafe working conditions and insecure work. Um, and that's one thing we desperately need to organise. Um, not just the struggle itself, but a political pole of attraction that organises rank and file workers independent of trade union bureaucrats who say that they're on our side, who say that they're um, here working for the struggle of the working class in the unions, but actually are seeking to sell us out at every turn. And one example of that, which I think is useful to talk about, um, which our organisation, Socialist Alternative, has played a role in, um, is the, in the context of universities, the National Tertiary Education Union, the um, Teachers Union, which covers both lecturers and um, administrative staff at universities. Um, they basically, at the onset of the crisis, because our university system relies a lot on international students, a lot of that was cut off because of the travel bans. And so in order to make up that shortfall in revenue, um, the universities are seeking to take massive cuts and massive layoffs, restructures, redundancies, um, just go on a huge offensive against the workers. And the union is essentially, they drew up a deal called the Jobs Protection Framework, which sold out a 15% wage cut for workers. Um, and they tied that up with the boss's organisation and then came back to the workers and said, here's a 15% wage cut. It's not going to save all of the jobs, but it's the best we could do. Um, and they didn't even try to organise a fight. Our organisation then set up a rank and file organisation and network of um, university lecturers and staff in order to fight back against that concession and that sellout. And successfully, we voted it down and are now fighting campus to campus against job cuts and attacks and redundancies. Um, and we're stronger for it because we haven't accepted the politics of concessions in order to protect the capitalist economy, but no concessions to fight for protecting every single condition and every single dime of the wages of the working class um, against attacks and sellouts from union bureaucrats and the bosses in league with each other. So, yeah, in the near future, as the crisis gets deeper and deeper, keeping an eye on bloated organisations of social democracy, reformism and union bureaucrats who claim to be on our side but then seek to sell us out at every turn, I think, creating an alternative pole of attraction to that is going to be a key battle. Um, and that's one of the main points I sort of wanted to contribute to this discussion in terms of lessons that we've learned from Australia and, and something that we're trying to organise around here. Um, all of the fault lines, yeah, are going to be rank and file, trade union bureaucrat, as well as left and right, um, bosses against workers and all of that. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Gracias, Nick, de Alternativa Socialista de Australia. Görmüş olduk ve bu başarının da aslında genel bir mücadele... La realidad concreta es que tenemos coincidencia a pesar de las grandes distancias. Los informes de los compañeros han sido contundentes, tanto de Pakistán como de Turquía, de Estados Unidos, 
lo que nos contaba recién Nick, eh, y la necesidad ¿no? de seguir construyendo organizaciones en los diferentes ámbitos educativos, independiente de las autoridades y de los gobiernos, en defensa de la cientificidad, la gratuidad, el carácter público de nuestra educación en cada país, para enfrentar los embates privatistas y las políticas y las orientaciones en torno a ser más elitista nuestra universidad y que no sea de acceso a las grandes mayorías. Ahora nomás estamos terminando de afinar eh, lo, el tema de la traducción, porque llegan los informes del compañero, de los compañeros del Líbano. Luis, ¿estás para traducir? Dije un montón, Luis. Sí. Eh... Y es, esperen los compañeros que traducen de, de Turquía y del Urdu, ¿sí? Okay, so we, um, we've had uh, several reports already from comrades from comrades from Pakistan, from Turkey, from the U.S., and from Australia and from Argentina. So we are waiting a couple of seconds now, a couple of minutes to get um, solve some problems with translation. And uh, coming up, we'll, we, we will have comrades from Lebanon. Um, from all of these uh, interventions from the comrades, we know that the, um, the struggles, the, despite the distances, the struggles against this capital si capitalist system that makes our lives precarious, that attacks our, our education, that attacks our work, and that attacks our lives, th these struggles are, are the same uh, around the world. So uh, yes. we will just wait for a couple of minutes uh, so we can have the comrades from Lebanon, which will be speaking up next. Gracias, Luis. Majed, ¿me escuchás? Sí, yo escucho. Perfecto, entonces, no espero más para presentar a Alid Hamoud, del Movimiento por el Cambio del Líbano. Y so presenting Ali Hamoud, from the Movement for Change of Lebanon. Okay. Sí, todo bien. Todo. Sí. Todo. Sí. Todo. Sí. Todo. Sí. Todo. Sí. Todo. Todo. Sí. Todo. Todo. Sí. Todo. Un saludo desde Beirut, que se rebelió el 17 de octubre con un levantamiento popular que salió para derrotar el sistema de corrupción y sistema de robo. Saludos a todos los camaradas del mundo. Greetings from Beirut, which rebelled on October 17th in a popular uprising that uh, defeated the system of corruption. And greetings to comrades from across the world. Lebanon is going through its uh, the greatest crisis of its history, a crisis that can reach an important collapse, but also opens an historic opportunity that may not repeat itself. The Lebanese political system is a generator of crisis and incapable of building a stable state. It has been bankrupt, politically bankrupt for years. Esta bancarrota estuvo acompañada por la bancarrota. This bankruptcy, this political bankruptcy, uh, came along with an economic bankruptcy that began years ago. Under the responsibility and the political authority of the banks, and has been linked to uh, the structure and function of a system that has been established through years of government of a dependent bourgeoisie. The poor and the workers of Lebanon suffer the, the absence of the most simple services like water, electricity, uh, diesel, gasoline, health system, uh, employment, and 
a complete failure of a system to manage the COVID-19 crisis. It's time to go beyond this system and build a new one based on social justice and national liberation, a system that can eliminate uh, exploitation and the theft of workers, a system that can respect uh, humanity and ensure the most basic rights to work, to health, to education, uh, to housing. Comenzamos en el Líbano una marcha revolucionaria el 17 de octubre. In Lebanon, we began a revolutionary march on October 17th, a march that we insist in on completing to achieve its objectives and begin with the dismantling of this regime and the liberation of our people and all forms of external and internal domination. Estamos luchando en el Líbano contra la We're otra... fighting in Lebanon against the political authority and its militias, but our eyes are permanently marked south, pointing south towards the Israeli enemy, which continues threatening us and the security of our people. La agresión de la entidad sionista ha sido evidente durante semanas. The, the Zionist aggression has been evident for weeks in its intents to annex Arab lands in the West Bank. And this unacceptable act will be a, will have a response of the resistance of the popular resi armed resistance from Gaza to the West Bank. Queridos camaradas de todo el mundo, nuestra lucha es única. Dear comrades across the world, our struggle is one, even if our problems are different and complex. Our struggle is because our enemy is one, and it is imperialism and the global capitalist system. Our only option is confrontation and struggle. Who struggles can lose, and who doesn't struggle is already lost in all cases. Viva la lucha de los pueblos abajo el imperialismo. Long live the people's struggle, down with imperialism, death to racism and Zionism. Y en nuestro segundo informe, si hay tiempo, vamos a hablar de la lucha estudiantil que estamos haciendo ahora. So in the second round, if there is time, eh, we will say some things also about education in Lebanon. Thank you, Ali. The reports from across the world are impressive. It's what we were saying, that we have a common enemy and we struggle for the same thing. So international unity, solidarity, our common flags are what unite us. We are part of the same. We're going to stop the translation just one second to change the translators. Okay. Um, 
Okay, um, we have to hold for a second the interpretation, the translation, uh, so we can shift the comrades that are doing that work. Y en minutos nomás largamos porque todavía nos queda el gigante de América, Brasil, que en minutos nos va a estar contando cuál es la situación que están viviendo allá en materia de precarización y a nivel educativo. Nada más. Now, Brazilian comrades are fighting against Bolsonaro. Así Bolsonaro, que, Karsh, many countries of Latin America and are also fighting against this precarization of education. Un segundinho no más, que ya largamos con los compañeros de Brasil. Just wait a minute and we will go to our comrades of Brazil. Pero como les decía recién, también tenemos, escuchen, España, Francia, México con el compañero Saúl, Nicaragua, Paraguay, Perú, el Sahara Occidental y Ucrania. Bueno, el compañero Ítalo Freitas de Alternativa Socialista Brasil. Ítalo, ¿me escuchás? Hoy, escucho. Perfecto, Ítalo. I can hear you. Vamos nomás. Continúa. You can start. Hello from Brazil to all comrades. Comrades who have started. Excuse me, can you please turn on the camera? Si no, continúa así. Probleminha no vídeo. You can keep going. Ok, continue, please. Pronto. <laughs> That's it. Está dando para ver? Can you see me? Yes, great. Saudações do Brasil a todos os camaradas. So, greetings from Brazil to all comrades. For those who organized and are participating in this forum. There are many issues, and this is very important when people consider uh, this moment in which we need, uh, in, in this moment in which workers cannot work. There is a great number of workers which cannot uh, have a, an, a general income. We are facing the social issues. Here in Brazil, the youth doesn't have any access to an income. They don't have expectations. They don't have uh, their basic need, needs covered or any kind of public education. They have to face police brutality. Uh, especially those who are poor and the black community. Uh, in Brazil, we have a similar situation uh, of that that the comrades have talked about. Uh, but something that is very important is how the pandemic of the coronavirus is uh, has reached 40% of the population, which is now vulnerable and has been pushed because of their economic conditions to go to work anyways. Uh, and now they don't see any kind of future. People flee Brazil 
46% of people who graduate from university cannot find a job, even though they are qualified. But they have to sell their workforce and have precarious jobs. In second place, there is a privatization process going on. Uh, the policies of this government of Bolsonaro, he has a privatization initiative. It is true that capitalism is growing through a crisis and that it's decaying. And another issue of the um, class struggle is that a great resistance has arisen. The youth has been a main subject of the fights against the government of Bolsonaro. And they are fighting for public university and higher education. Depois de muita pressão da comunidade escolar, da juventude, é... and the youth and the students community, a renovação de um fundo de investimento na educação, uh, are fighting for the Congress against the Congress, which has voted a cut in the education budget. Desse processo de, de mobilizações. So they are the main protagonist of this mobilization process. Uh, another community that is making an, a more pressure is the LGBT community. Congressmen have rejected a program for schools to uh, talk about uh, gender identity. Right, young majorities uh, among these 40% of professionals who are qualified uh, cannot withstand these uh, working conditions to which are they are subject. But they still have a hope and conviction to get over the situation and get significant changes for the working class. This regime is a systematic misery. And this causes great, great mobilizations of the working class in Brazil. This, um, this arises uh, the hope and expectations among the working class in Brazil. First of all, we have the task of organizing this youth and to unite that uh, young sector with the working people who are already organized. This resistance is living in young people and they have um, reached great victories. Thank you, Italo. And now from Chile, Joaquin Aranea is going to talk from the anti movimiento de capitalismo. Hola, hola. Hola, ¿Sí? Perfecto. Bueno, en primer lugar, saludamos a cada compañero y compañero. Hello, greetings in first place for all comrades. In this event that we are newly taking up from the International Socialist League, so I don't want to repeat, but there are things we can highlight. 
So we have to strengthen the development of events in the last period. Because the economic crisis, the health crisis have all become worse and have worsened under the logic of a permanent accumulation of capital. And this is what capitalism in its decadent stages. And this, ex this expresses in the following way in a country like ours. In which uh, the background for an uncontrolled uh, virus is the uh, economic crisis and a collapse of uh, the health and education system. So the uh, higher education percentage in Chile is only 31%. And this has been the capitalist system that transformed the educational system in this way. And all of this is the background of the rebellion that exploded last year with the right wing and the parliamentary left that allow this process of indebtment and perpetual payment of this debt while the youth has trash contracts in, in precarious labor that offer no future. This has been the reality of recent history and the Chilean rebellion began with the uh, incredible radicalization of the youth. And it was the youth that uh, took up a, a class response that then uh, infected the rest of society. And this rebellion became a, a school of revolution with a permanent confrontation with the security forces. And this is where a generation of, of militants is educating itself in class struggle. We can't understand the current moment with the uh, sharpening of contradictions, of social contradictions. So we can understand the current moment without seeing this uh, issue of the youth that is uh, the most affected by social decay and is therefore on the front lines of the struggle against the system. This is what feeds the radicalization of the youth against the uh, ideologies of possibilism that is reflected in the parliamentary left that, uh, that ties uh, pacts and agreements with the right-wing government. And the result of all this is that they cannot control everything. And we're seeing this again lately. When a rapist uh, protected by the highest uh, spheres of power was uh, liberated in the middle of the pandemic. And this sparked a new rebellion with people on the streets protesting against this. And the government had to retreat two days later and send them back to jail. Days later, there was an initiative in the Senate where the mobilization again, again made the government retreat. So there's a, a rebellion from below that is caused by the reaction against neoliberal policies and had the President Pineda against the ropes 
So this is where our tasks come in. Because the 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 um, parliamentary left that has pacted with the with the right resurfaces the old debate with reformists, in which no real change is possible without a a uprooting the the system and. I mean, uh, a fundamental change of society, a revolutionary change. And this is the only way to have a future. So to conclude, the demand that the International Socialist League has already been uh, campaigning with, we must continue uh, demanding the, the liberty of all political prisoners in Chile who are being held in terrible health conditions in the middle of the pandemic. And the last thing I want to say is to um, disseminate our, our manifesto. And as we say in that manifesto, against uh, racism, against exploitation, and for a collective solution to the crisis. These are our uh, banners, these are our proposals for uh, another future that is possible. Uh, so greetings to everyone.